Here we're looking back at the Earth from the moon. It's very beautiful. It, it sits in this black void, and it looks like a blue and white marble. I've used some artist's license, and in my painting, which is called Mother Earth, I've sort of enhanced the contrast between the continents and the water. So if you look closely, you can see uh, North America, Central America, and down into South America. And this was possible to see it exactly this way, about halfway to the moon. But once we got near the moon and further away, the blue haziness that we see looking up just in the daytime from Earth, you sort of get a little of that looking back through the atmosphere the other direction. And so it was very difficult to see the outlines of the continents because usually near the shoreline was green forests and grasses. And with the blue atmosphere, they turned almost blue. So it looked almost like the water. The way uh, I managed to figure it out when I would see something yellow, which I knew was a desert, but I didn't know it was the Gobi Desert or the Sahara or just what, is I'd call back to Earth and say, uh, what tracking station are we being tracked through now? And they would say, for example, if they said Australia, then I would know that it was an Australian desert. And it wasn't the Sahara after all. If we could look inside the cockpit right now, we would see Neil Armstrong is looking out the left window, which is to our right, and Buzz Aldrin is looking out the right window. And they're just about to touch down. The descent engine, which I used a little artist license on to give it some brilliance, is firing, and it's as if we're standing on the moon watching him come in and, and land right before us. We can see the light reflected off the bottom foil of the descent stage. We can see on the right landing leg, the, the probe sticking down, which had a little sensor on it. And then when Neil and Buzz got that distance from the moon, the little sensor would close, a light would illuminate in the cockpit and give them a clue to shut down the engine and fall the last few feet in for a landing. Also at the top, we can see the opening where the hatch is, where Neil would, once they'd landed, would come out that hatch, walk down the ladder near the front leg, step down to the landing pad, then he would step over onto the dirt and uh, make his comment that this is a small step for a man, but a giant leap for mankind. It was the most complex vehicle that's really, I think, ever been uh, invented for space flight. This lunar module was probably the first true spaceship ever built. We're looking at a painting of Neil Armstrong, the first human on the moon. He's hanging on the side of the ladder. His right foot is on the foot pad right in front of the ladder that he came down from the lunar module. He has not yet stepped off. Actually, what he's doing is holding on there to get his balance. It takes a few minutes to get your balance right, and then he's going to lean out, and he's going to put his left foot down, and when he does, he'll make the first human footprint on another world. This will never happen again. People will go back to the moon. People will go to Mars. People will go to the moons of Jupiter, and then many years from now, maybe they'll go to planets around some other star. But there will never be a first time that a human actually stepped on a place other than this Earth except July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong. I've dreamed myself that someday when humans go back to the moon, they'll visit this site. And I hope what they do is take some special fencing or tape or something and put it all around this Tranquility Bay site so that as humans go visit it over the centuries, no one will walk out there and disturb the footprints made by our first explorers, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. I can recall looking out at that crater and moving along next to it as fast as I could. I weighed just 50 pounds up there with my suit and backpack. It was quite easy for me to, to leap, and it felt like as I would push off and be space-borne above the moon for quite a lengthy period of time, and in land that I was making tremendous long leaps. But because of the light gravity, it's not possible to push off and go very far. So even though we were off the moon for, seemed like, a long pause, 
we didn't really move very far horizontally, and we didn't go up very high either. It was almost like running in slow motion. I tended to use my ankles more than my knees or hips when I ran because of the light weight and because the joint in my suit was easier to, to operate down at the ankle joint. Also, I didn't move my hands back and forth like I would do if I were running here on earth because the suit was built so that the hands, if you relaxed your arms, would go out in front of you, sort as you see them right there in this painting. As I worked on this painting of Jim Irwin leading Dave Scott, both Apollo 15 astronauts around on the moon, I was struck by how much this image looked like the pictures of 16th century explorers, conquistadors, that I'd seen in books as a kid. Now, there's some big differences, of course, because the conquistadors back in the 1500s came to claim lands and gold and precious gems for their king and queen. But all we came for was knowledge and understanding. A few rocks and a little bit of dust was all that we wanted. We carried no weapons, just tools for digging and measuring. We were space-age conquistadors, and we truly came in peace for all mankind. The painting on the left is probably the most famous photo from Apollo. It was a photo taken by Neil Armstrong of Buzz Aldrin, and what I've done is taken that photo and recreated it, added a lot more color to it, and made it, I think, uh, more beautiful. But the whole idea of doing this painting for me was to do a, another painting that showed Neil Armstrong as he took this painting. One of the things that we found out when uh, Neil and Buzz got back from the moon is we didn't have any good images of Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon. We had a lot of Buzz Aldrin, and the reason was Neil had the camera on mounted on his suit, and Buzz didn't have a camera, but probably did this to save weight, but we didn't know any better at the time. Pete and I, when we went on Apollo 12 and all the other missions, carried two cameras. I then did this painting using uh, the reflection in Buzz's visor of what Neil looked like. I built some little models that I do to get them accurate in terms of sun angle and shadows and all that sort of thing. And in looking at some of the training photos, I saw that when Neil took photos, he pulled the trigger of the uh, handle on the camera that would snap the photo, but he would put his other hand underneath the handle to steady the camera. And so I've painted him that way in the painting on the right. So I think this is probably the best image uh, that I've ever seen of Neil Armstrong on the moon. When Al Shepard and Ed Mitchell on Apollo 14 were nearing the end of their EVAs, uh, Al moved towards the camera, and he was holding something in his right hand, and he said, hey, you might recognize what I've got here. I've got a genuine six iron attached to the end of my contingency sample handle. And in my other hand, I've got two little white pellets that uh, many people on Earth will recognize. And so he uh, stepped a little closer to the camera. He dropped one of the pellets, and he said, this is a golf ball. It's going to be difficult to hit because I can't use two hands and swing in this bulky suit, but I can kind of turn to the side here and use one arm. So he took a swing, and dirt flew. The ball kind of rolled along the ground and dropped in a crater. Al said, don't worry, got another ball. He dropped it down. He gave another swing, and off goes the ball. That's the one I painted here. I'll tell you this, when you hit that ball in that 1-6 gravity with a vacuum of space, it's going to go four or five times farther than it does on, on Earth, and with the small diameter of the moon, easily go out of sight. The two astronauts in this painting are Pete and I. I'm the guy that's fallen on the lunar surface, 
is this happened to me a couple of times, and usually it was when I was backing up to take a photo of a rock or something like that, and there'd be a small rock maybe hidden by the dust cover of the moon, and then I would trip on it, and sometimes I could catch myself and not fall backwards, but several times I fell backwards as, uh, as I've painted here. Now, I could roll over and get up, but it took a lot of energy, and usually Pete was nearby because we were working as a team, and so we didn't want to use up our energy just rolling over and getting up, so he came over, and the first time he reached down and grabbed me and pulled me <laughs> in that light gravity, I came up so fast that I bumped into him, and both of us nearly fell over backwards. But the second time I fell back like this, he came over and he extended just his index finger. I reached up with my index finger, and he lifted me slowly up to a standing position, getting ready to get back to work. And uh, I've titled this painting... He ain't heavy, he's my brother. And I think one of the beautiful things about our Apollo 12 crew was we were all like brothers. We wanted to do a great job, but we wanted to have a good time on the way to the moon, on the moon, and on the way back home. The painting is titled For One Priceless Moment and shows Apollo 11 astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin completing what I think was the most significant thing they did during their historic landing on the moon in July of 1969. Buzz is on the left. He's trying to pull some of the wrinkles out of the flag. Neil is on the right. He's trying to get the flagstaff stuck in the dirt and not get it pulled over. With no atmosphere on the moon, we had to put some sort of curtain rod at the top of the flagstaff because without wind, the flag would have just hung limp all the time. So if you look closely at the painting, you can see there is a curtain rod up there that the top part of the flag is attached to. But the reason Buzz is pulling on it is the little rod didn't come out as far as it should. And in just a few minutes, Buzz lets go of the flag, and then Neil tries to put it in the dirt. He has a little difficulty because it's very hard to go into the dirt over about four or five inches. As Neil said, I push the flagstaff into the ground at a slight angle, such that the center of gravity of the overall unit would be above the point at which the flagstaff was inserted in the lunar surface. That seemed to hold it all right. It was a delicate balance. I'm often asked, which stories do I want to tell when I create a painting? Uh, what I've done is think and make a list of the stories that I think are the most interesting from my experiences on the moon. And I also talked to all my astronaut friends that were on the moon and asked them what was their favorite stories. What would they like me to paint that maybe wasn't on a, a photograph or something like that that might preserve it uh, long after we're gone? A story that uh, Pete and I had was the one I've shown here. It shows the two of us in front of our lunar module, and this is the end of our EVAs, end of our moonwalks, two moonwalks. And as I'm walking out to collect a, an experiment, I see this big piece of foil laying on the surface. And it was a foil that had covered this antenna you see there, the gold antenna, uh, to protect it thermally uh, before we deployed it. And I thought, wow. It'd be fun to throw this up in the air. So I took it underhanded and threw it just as high as I could. And I can remember it going up and up and slowly turning over as it went up. And, of course, the sun would flash off it. So it was like a blinking light as it went up and up and up. Well, I couldn't wait till it went all the way up and down. I had work to do. So I had to quit looking at it and get back to collecting experiments. And we had to get ourselves back in the lunar module so that we could uh, launch and head up to Dick Gordon in the command module and then head back to Earth. This painting is titled Pete and Me. Of all the astronauts I ever met, he was my all-time favorite astronaut. I think he was the best astronaut that ever put on a spacesuit, largely because he always seemed to do the right thing. He just had the instinct in situations where nobody knew what to do to choose the best way. He could get along with 
anybody. He just seemed to possess all the characteristics that, that I admired. I painted this picture of him as he's taking my picture. You can see me as the little guy there in the visor. This was about two hours into our first walk on the moon. Well, it's just about this time after I, he took my picture, I reached down to my cuff checklist that was on my left wrist, and that cuff checklist is the thing that tells you relative to what time it is on your watch what you should be doing. For example, I could look at my watch and say, huh, I've been outside two hours and ten minutes. I need to deploy this experiment, take three pictures, align this one, tell us what to do. And I flipped the page, and I'll be darned if there wasn't a little Playboy bunny on my checklist. I couldn't believe it. I'd been using checklists all these years in NASA and never saw anything like that. So I ran over to Pete and looked at his checklist, and he had a little Playboy bunny on his. You can see it there in the painting. And we chuckled. We didn't say anything about it to each other on the air because we were afraid that there might be some little old ladies back on Earth that would get real mad if they knew their tax dollars had transported Playboy bunnies up to the moon. When I was running and walking and working on the moon, uh, often I would look up at, to see where the Earth was. It was always about 20 degrees, 30 degrees, really, from the vertical over towards the east. And I would look there and say, wow, what a beautiful blue and white world we live on. I'd look down at my feet or look off in the distance on the moon. What I saw was dark gray rocks, dark gray dirt, a shiny black sky. And I just compared that world to the one that was where we came from and where we were going to return in a few more days. And I thought, wow, we, we don't even know sometimes on Earth how wonderful it is. If we think back to the probes we've sent out into the universe or the telescopes that were built uh, over the years and we've looked out into the universe, we've never seen any place as beautiful as if we just walk out our back door and look around. We've never seen anything like a tree or a bush or a rabbit or any a human being or any beings. Now, maybe they're out there somewhere uh, on planets around other stars. There's 20 billion stars in our galaxy alone, the Milky Way, and many of them have planetary systems around them, we believe. So maybe someday we'll go out and visit one of those and we'll find a place that's as beautiful as the Earth. But that's not going to happen anytime soon. But we have been gifted with the planet Earth to live in our whole life long. I've painted Apollo 16 astronauts John Young and Charlie Duke just unloading their rover as they've arrived on the edge of North Ray Crater. John mentioned as they climbed the rim of the North Ray, it was really a steep slope all the way up. But the rover, even though it was only powered by four small quarter horsepower electric motors, just went right up the 20 degree slope. I've painted John on the left, selecting some tools for the exploration. And I've painted Charlie Duke on the right, and he's got a Hasselblad camera in his hand with 500 millimeter lens on it, so he can take some photos of the far side of the crater. Well, they moved a little bit closer to the crater, and it turns out it was so steep and so dark that they couldn't see the bottom of it. They did take some 500 millimeter pictures, but they didn't want to get too close, because if either of them had ever fallen in, there'd have been no way out, and the other one had been coming home alone. North Ray Crater was the largest crater, something like 300 feet in diameter, and the deepest crater, who knows how deep it was, directly explored in the Apollo program. This painting is titled Helping Hands. It's one of my favorites because it brings back a lot of nice memories of Pete Conrad and I working together on the moon. You can see both of our Hasselblad cameras there. You can see our backpacks where we got our oxygen and cooling and, and the like. Now, when we finished our explorations, we wanted to just bring back as many rocks as we could 
and therefore we had to leave a lot of things that were excess weight. For example, we left both cameras on the moon, we left our backpacks on the moon, we left those control units that the cameras are mounted on, we left those gloves on the moon, and we even left the, uh, the visors and we left the boots on the moon. So we left quite a number of things up there that are up there even today. They're not rusting, they're not wearing out. Someday people will go up there recovering them. And if they haven't been in the sunshine, if they've been packed away, I think they'll be in fairly good condition because there'll be no moisture, no radiation. I don't think anybody will want to use them, but they still will be preserved rather well up there. The title of this painting is, Is Anyone Out There? And uh, there I am in the painting, leaning back and looking straight out into infinity. Uh, now, most of us have wondered over the years, I know I have, are we alone? Or is there just human beings around? Or is there some higher power out in the universe? I didn't know the answer. Some people have faith that they know the answer. I never could find that faith myself. And so I said, when I go out in space, when I go on my flight to the moon, I'm going to set some time aside to see if I get any special insights that I don't have on Earth. Well, I didn't find that to be true for me. I wasn't able to get any insights either on the flight out or the flight back from the moon or on the surface when I did look up uh, into the blackness of infinity. Uh, some people might say, hey, you just didn't listen hard enough. Heck, maybe they're right. I don't even know. But uh, since coming back to Earth, that was a long time ago. My feeling is the answer is never somewhere else. The answer for all of us is inside us in our own hearts. If we'll look in there, we'll find out if there is, in fact, anybody out there. Most of us astronauts were test pilots because flying rocket ships and spaceships, the closest thing to it you can learn on Earth is flying airplanes. So that's the background that most of us came from. There was one exception in the Apollo program, and that was Jack Schmidt. And we see here him in the foreground handling a small scoop, and he was a geologist. Now, when we all came to the space program as test pilots, and we knew we were going to the moon, and we had to spend a lot of time studying geology so that when we got to the moon, we'd know which rocks to collect and how to do it. Jack Schmidt had the opposite problem. He was a geologist, and so we had to send him to flight school so he could learn to fly airplanes, because everybody in the Apollo crew had to be skilled at flight. Well, anyway, here's Jack on the, on the moon, and he's digging in the side of a crater. I can remember him doing this. I was back in mission control, and he could see light and dark layering in the trench wall. And this was a first, and a really interesting observation because it lets you know that there were several different geologic events that took place right there and by sampling those different layers scientists back on earth could tell the difference in time they occurred and um, what caused each one. One of the things to be aware of is all the rocks and material there are older than any rock we can find on earth. The youngest rock we can look at there is probably three and a half billion years old. And you can't find anything like that on Earth because all that material has been eroded away by, by the wind and the rain and the oceans through the centuries. After the Apollo program was completed, the people of New Mexico elected Jack to the United States Senate. And so I titled the painting, Senator Smith Sample Subsurface Soil. I'm showing Neil Armstrong pushing down on the top of the box containing the rocks that he collected, and he's trying to use his right hand to operate some clamps that will hold the lid down. Neil and Buzz knew before they went to the moon that the single most important thing that they had to do, besides get home safely, was to collect rocks and bring them home. And the best way to do it was to collect them not touching them with anything that had any human germs or human elements on it and put them in that rock box, the box would remain 
airtight, that is, it would keep a, the same vacuum in it that there is on the moon, and then scientists would be able to open it in a vacuum on Earth, and they would have some rocks to sample that uh, were truly in pristine condition. Well, what happened was, even on training on Earth, that worked out real great. But up here with this rock box, in the cold shadow of the lunar module here, apparently the indium got a little bit stiff, so when he pushed down on the lid, he wasn't able to push it down far enough with his left hand so that he could operate the clamps. The knife edge just wouldn't bite into the indium. Well, he did it several times, and finally at the very end he said, I'm going to give it one more shot, and if it doesn't work, we'll just have to bring it home open. Well, one more push, one more pull on the lever, and the first lever clamped shut. So we were able to get the rocks back from the moon in the vacuum they should have been. This is a painting of Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt working at Station 6 on the moon. When the painting was finished, I invited Gene Cernan to come over and look at it. Well, he came over and looked, and he gave me some advice. He said, for example, uh, the valley down there seemed a little darker than you painted it. So I changed that. I was showing him the footprints over in the right corner where he'd gone up and down the edge of that mountain. He remembered that. Then I showed him over there on the left side of the boulder, that vertical mark, and I said, this is where you took some samples. He says, no. Uh, I didn't use my sample tool there. I just went ahead and used my hand, and I scraped some dust off that boulder and brought it back uh, for sampling. I talked with him a little bit more about it, and he says, you know what I wish I'd done? And I said, what? And he says, I wish I'd written my daughter's name in the dust of that boulder. Well, his daughter and my daughter were friends, so I gave him a piece of paper, and I said, write her name on this piece of paper in your handwriting like you would have. And so he did. Her name is Tracy. So after he left, I got out my paints, and I wrote Tracy's name there in the dust. And I retitled the painting Tracy's Boulder. And it's one of my favorites, and I feel real good about it every time I look at it because I think of all the money I saved all of us taxpayers because he doesn't have to go back up there to the moon and write Tracy's name in the dust. As an artist, I could do it for him. I've painted Dave Scott on the plains of Hadley, which is the area they landed on. Their Apollo 15 mission was the first one to have a rover and the first one to land in mountainous areas. The first three flights of the Apollo program, we landed in relatively flat plains because we weren't sure how accurate our guidance system was going to be. Well, we can see from the background that Dave's crew was able to use the improved guidance system and procedures we developed to land safely near some mountainous areas and go over and take samples from those kind of rocks. I painted Dave here saluting. I recall the words at his press conference when he said, you know, we went to the moon as trained observers in order to gather data, not only with our own instruments, but also with our minds. Plutarch, a wise man who lived a long time ago, expressed the feelings of the crew of Apollo 15 when he wrote, The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. In this painting, we see Jim Irwin. He's one of my favorite astronauts. Uh, I got to know him real well because he was my backup on Apollo 12, and then he went on to fly Apollo 15. This is a painting I did of Jim Irwin as I think he would like to be remembered. He's dead now. He died of a heart attack some years ago. And uh, Jim was uh, a guy that you could always count on, very quiet in demeanor, very easy to like, easy to work with. But I had no idea he was as religious as he turned out to be. He quoted several biblical passages when he was on the moon. And uh, when he came back from the flight, he became an evangelist and started an organization called High Flight. One of his comments was uh, the most important thing wasn't that man walked on the moon, but Jesus walked on earth. When I finished this painting, I was looking at it, 
and I was trying to think of a title. My wife, Leslie, walked into the room, and I was telling her some that I were considered. They weren't that good. And she said, it should be we came in peace for all mankind because that's what we did in Apollo. And what Jim is demonstrating here is a, a universal position, a universal way of coming in peace for all mankind. I titled this painting, A Reflection of the Best. The American flag still proudly flies at six dusty, now abandoned exploration sites on the moon. Apollo 11 placed the first at Tranquility Base, and we all watched transfixed on our television sets. Pete Conrad, Dick Gordon, and I were next on the ocean of storms. Fraumauer, Hadley Apennines, Descartes, and Taurus Littrow followed. That's all happened a long time ago, but it was an effort to put together some of the pieces that answer the questions, who are we and where do we come from? One of my most vivid impressions as I walked and ran and bunny hopped on the cratered surface was a feeling of the immense distance, some 240,000 miles between Pete, Dick, and me and everyone else I'd ever seen or heard about. Also on my mind at this moment, was the knowledge that a lot of sophisticated hardware would have to perform as advertised to get us back home again. I knew, we all knew, that this hardware on which our lives depended was designed and built, not by the lowest bidder, as a lot of people like to kid us about, but it was built by the best people on the planet Earth. We knew that 300,000 Americans, men and women of thought and men and women of action, had given their best. And our country's best was not just good enough, it was perfection, it was unbeatable. The American flag was the first and still the only flag on the moon. This is a painting of the Apollo 17 ascent stage as it approaches the command module. We can see the rendezvous radar antenna at the top, we can see the other antennas, we can see the little ascent engine underneath the center of the ascent stage. We can see the hatch where Jack Schmidt and Gene Cernan had come out so they could go down the ladder of the descent stage and walk on the lunar surface. It was a nifty little flying machine. I remember the flight of the ascent stage as one of the most fun times of space flight. I was over on the right-hand side working with my backup computer and my charts and watching the systems. Pete Conran was running the primary computer and doing the controlling of the lunar module uh, and also looking out the left-hand window. When we were about 30 minutes from rendezvous with Dick Gordon in the command module, Pete said to me, boy, Al, you look like you're working too hard over there. You want to take a break? Well, I'd been training with this guy for two years and he never told me to take a break on any rendezvous. And here we were doing for real. He says, you know, Al, you want to fly this thing? And I said, well, yeah, I'd like to fly it as I took the controls out of that. Well, wait a minute. I'm liable to get us off course. He says, well, let's call up this computer program that measures velocity. And whatever velocity you put in in any direction, it'll measure it. And then when you're finished flying it around, we'll take it out, you know, go back to where it was. I thought, that's a good idea. Let's do it. So he called up the com- the computer program, I was just about to do it, and he said, I said to him, I said, wait a minute, the people on Earth in Mission Control aren't going to like this. And to show how he thinks about things, he said, don't worry about it. We're on the backside of the moon. They'll never know. So sure enough, we were, <laughs> and I flew it around and enjoyed it. And it was all over. Uh, we put it all back to zero, and before we came out on the side of the moon where you can see the Earth, we were back steadily rendezvousing. When I later commanded Skylab Mission 3, went up with two people that hadn't gone, I tried to think of things during the mission that would make it fun for them, too. I don't think I ever equaled Pete Conrad's thinking and effort, but I tried to to do it a little bit anyway, in my own way. This is a painting that shows what it must look like if someone were standing on the moon as the ascent stage lifted off from the descent stage and headed up to orbit and rendezvous with the command module. All those little pieces that are flying out are little 
pieces of gold and silver and black foil blown off the descent stage. I can recall when we lifted off the moon, I looked out the right window, which is the left one as we look at the painting, and as we lifted off the moon, I could see all these little twinkly things going away from our lunar module. That rocket engine, which would be tremendously loud on Earth, in the atmosphere on Earth, is not audible. So as I looked out the window, I didn't hear the rocket engine fire. It was almost magical. I knew that our life hinged on that one engine, and it had to burn, for, in our case, six minutes, three seconds. So all during the time that little engine was shooting Pete Conrad and I up towards orbit, I was thinking, well, that's two minutes, four minutes to go, then another minute, three minutes, three minutes to go. If that had ever quit, which it never did on any of our missions, the little lunar module would have fallen back and impacted the moon, and in our case, Dick Gordon would have had to come home alone. It had been a long journey for him. When I painted this painting, I had the flag facing the other way because that's the way it was on Apollo 11. But as I was just finishing the flag, I remembered that when we blasted off the moon, that the rocket exhaust had spun the flag around, making it f go the other way, sort of weather veining. So I called up Buzz to ask him if that's what happened to their flag. And he didn't remember, even though it was on his window side. And I called up Neil and asked him, and Neil said, you know, I looked over there, and the flag spun around. And he says, I'm not sure it didn't fall over. Well, I didn't think we should have the American flag falling over, so when I painted it, I just tipped it over at that nice little angle. That's how it felt to walk on the moon, is the title of this painting. When I began it, I began it with the idea of painting it in some way that it would show, as an artist would show, how I felt to walk on the moon, because it's the single most asked question that I receive. Well, I used an image of myself there, and I first began by making me all gold, because I thought, you know, that's how I felt. I felt really so happy about everything. I was so glad to be there. It just, it was a culmination of everything I'd really trained for in life, and here I was, and so it was a golden moment. And after I painted it gold, it just didn't convey that feeling. It was gold, all right, but it looked just like a metal astronaut. So I fooled around with a lot of different colors. Finally, I made it lighter, uh, more pastel looking, even though it's acrylic paint. And then I began to add all the colors of the rainbow because I felt those things symbolized happiness. So at the end, I came up with this painting, which I feel when I look at it shows the excitement and the happiness and the satisfaction that I felt when I was on the moon. We'd all worked a long time to get there. We were trying to do a job. A lot of people were counting on us. A lot of things can go wrong before you get to the moon, and uh, there I am, and that's how I remember feeling.